This Torah portion is the start of the book of Numbers. We call it Numbers in English because it opens with the numbering of the armies of Israel as they were preparing to enter the Promised Land. In Hebrew, the book is called the Midbar, which means in the wilderness. God spoke to the children of Israel in the wilderness about preparing to take the Promised Land. Both names focus on these preparations. God's instructions for beginning to take the land are given just one month after Moses erected the tabernacle and God moved his dwelling place from Mount Sinai to the tabernacle. Numbers 1 verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. God and the camp of Israel were just about ready to move. However, moving more than two million people takes a lot of organization. God gave Moses these last instructions to bolster the confidence of the people and make sure everything went smoothly. I'm Dan Cathcart, and this is Words from Our Father. The children of Israel were headed for the land that God promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, while Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had all lived in the land and even purchased some property in the land, the land itself did not yet belong to them. God promised that the entire land would be their inheritance, but they could not take it without a fight. In our modern world, world we might ask, what right the children of Israel had to take the land from the Canaanites. In this situation, God had originally given the land to the Canaanites, but their practices defiled the land. It was only after the fullness of their sin that God would give the land to the descendants of Abraham. This condition was spelled out by God in the covenant he made with Abraham. Look at Genesis 15, 15 through 16. Now as for you, you shall go to your father in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God had announced in his instructions to the children of Israel in Leviticus on how they could draw near to him and remain near him, that the promised land had rejected the Canaanites. Leviticus 18, 26 through 28. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done, who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. Lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Now even though God and the land had both rejected the current residents of the land, the Israelites would need to fight to take possession of the land. They would need a strong fighting force to accomplish this goal. The book of Numbers begins with the enumeration of the commission of the army. Look at Numbers 1 2 and 3. Take a census for all the congregation of the children of Israel, by their families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male individual, from twenty years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel. You and Aaron shall number them by their armies. Now armies don't just come together by declaring they exist. It requires organization and training to build an army. The training of the children of Israel for the war ahead of them to take the land began as soon as they had left Egypt. As they were leaving Egypt, the text tells us they went out in orderly ranks. Look at Exodus 13, verse 18. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Although the children of Israel weren't ready to take on the well-trained and armed Egyptian army, the children of Israel formed the rudiments of an organized force. The phrase orderly ranks is the Hebrew word kamush, 
number 2571 in the Strong's Concordant, meaning staunch, able-bodied soldiers or armed men. The word kamush comes from the word komesh, number 2570, meaning to do with the abdomen and the fifth rib, which is associated with being armed or girt with swords or belts around the fifth rib. The word kamush then has the connotation of not only being armed, but being determined in their path. The 17th century theologian Matthew Poole comments on the organization of the flight of the children of Israel from Egypt. Others render it kamush by fives, five and five in rank, that is, by usual military order, not doubtfully or and fearfully, but confidently and courageously, not confusedly as men that steal or run away, but in good order so as one might not hinder another, which interpretation is strengthened by comparing Joshua 1.14. In Joshua, the fledgling army of Israel had taken shape. The tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh were to send their armed men to participate in taking the land. The word kamush, in this case, is translated as armed. Joshua 1, verse 14. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them. Along the way to Mount Sinai, this fledgling army fought against the Amalekites. Although their skill may have been lacking, their confidence was bolstered when they looked up and saw Moses on the hill with both arms raised. Exodus 17 11-12. through And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now one year later, as the children of Israel were getting ready to head for the promised land, they had a full year to train and prepare for war. This particular census of the people before leaving Mount Sinai was only of those men who were able to fight. They were numbered according to their armies. The census began with the heads of each tribe who would stand with Moses. Numbers 1, 4, and 5. And with you... There shall be a man from every tribe, each one the head of his father's house. These are the names of the men who shall stand with you from Reuben, Elijah, the son of Shadur. The list continues for each tribe in birth order according to the mother. The list begins with the tribes from the sons of Leah, then from the sons of Rachel, and lastly the sons of the handmaidens. It leaves out the sons of Levi and splits the sons of Joseph into Ephraim and Manasseh. In the Bible, names have meanings. The stone edition Humash comments on the placement and meaning of the first and last names of the list of the heads of the tribes. The first name on the list was Elijah, which means, My God is the protector. The last name on the list, the father of Ariah, is Inan, which is synonymous with I. These names recall the verse, He protected them like the pupil of His eye, in Deuteronomy 32.10, an allusion to the clouds of glory that surrounded the nation in the wilderness. Thus, the order of the leaders alludes to the nation's faith that God was and would remain its protector. Now, each man introduces his tribe, his lineage, and the number of men he was contributing to the overall army of Israel. Numbers 1, 17 through 18. Then Moses and Aaron took these men who had been mentioned by name, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they recited their ancestry by families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and above, each one individually. When the roll call of the tribes was complete, 
there were a total of 603,550 men who were able to fight in the army of Israel. Numbers 1, 45-46 So all who were numbered of the children of Israel by their fathers' houses from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war in Israel, all who were numbered were 603,550. To give an idea of the size of this army, the entire army of the British Empire in 1775, prior to the American Revolution, was 48,000. By the end of the war, that number had increased to 121,000. In addition to these regular troops, Britain added others from the Irish and other foreign, uh, foreign nationals and other militia, which increased to a total size of British forces to nearly 200,000 soldiers. Now at this time, the British were also engaged in hostilities with France and Spain, in addition to the war in the American colonies. The army of the children of Israel was three times the size of the entire British army of the 18th century. When God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, he visually joined them at Sukkoth in the form of a pillar of fire and cloud. When they arrived at Mount Sinai, God's presence settled over the mountain and remained there during the rest of the year. The children of Israel camped at the foot of the mountain, but the mountain itself was holy to the Lord. Moses was told to set boundaries around the mountain and not let the people approach because they would die. Look at Exodus 19, 21 through 23. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. After the completion of the tabernacle, God's presence moved from the mountain to dwell in the tabernacle. And like the mountain, the children of Israel camped around the tabernacle. But God set boundaries around the tabernacle as well. The Levites were appointed as caretakers for the tabernacle. Numbers 1, 52-53 The children of Israel shall pitch their tents, everyone by his own camp, everyone by his own standard according to their armies. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, that there they be no wrath on the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. The Levites were to camp around the tabernacle on all sides, providing a barrier between the children of Israel and the tabernacle where the presence of God resided. In the book of Leviticus, God had provided a detailed explanation of how they were to approach him. They could not just stroll up to the tabernacle and enter God's presence any time and in any way they chose. God is holy, and God desired that his people be holy as well. God desired that they be able to approach him, but they had to go through the proper procedure so they would not be consumed by the fire of God. The children of Israel were camped around the tabernacle with three tribes on each side. This arrangement of the camp is mirrored by the configuration of the New Jerusalem described in Revelation. The glory of the Lord and the light of the Lamb are in the center of the city. Revelation 21 verse 23 The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. The wall of the city had twelve foundations that set the city apart like the Levites surrounded the tabernacle in the wilderness, setting it apart. These foundations are the twelve apostles who served Yeshua, our high priest. Revelation 21 verse 14 Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The gates of the city, with three on each side, just like the encampment of Israel, have the names of the twelve tribes written on them. Revelation 21, 12-13 
Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. At Mount Sinai in the wilderness, in Jerusalem, and again in the New Jerusalem, God chose to dwell in the middle of his people. The placements of the tribes around the tabernacle is mostly by birth order of each mother, with Leah's sons going first. However, since Reuben and Simeon were disqualified for the honor of the firstborn, and Levi had been taken in service to God and the priesthood, the firstborn honors of Leah's sons go to Judah, the fourth son. He is the leader of the eastern camp. Numbers 2, verse 3. On the east side, toward the rising of the sun, those of the standard of the forces with Judah shall camp according to their armies. And Nashon, the son of Amminadab, shall be the leader of the children of Judah. Judah's two younger brothers camp with him on the east. They were the first to break camp and lead the children of Israel on their journey. Numbers 2, verse 9. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces with Judah, 186,400, these shall break camp first. These are probably the names of the gates on the eastern side of the New Jerusalem, since the names have a meaning, so let's look at the names associated with the tribes and captains in this eastern side. Nashon is the captain of the tribe of Judah. His name is number 5172, is the most difficult one to understand. It can mean enchanter. However, Hitchcock's Bible names defines it as that which is foretold. The name Judah, number 3063, means celebrated. With him is Nathaniel of the tribe of Ishakar. Nathaniel, number 5417, means given of God, and Issachar, number 3485, means he will bring a reward. The third leader is Eliab of the tribe of Zebulun. Eliab is number 446, means God of his father, and Zebulun, number 2074, means habitation. We celebrate the coming of the one who is foretold. He comes with the reward given of God and the habitation of his Father. Now next to break camp were those on the south side of the tabernacle. Leah's two oldest sons were camped there along with Gad, the oldest son of Zilpah, Leah's handmaiden. The leader of this group is the oldest son, Reuben. Numbers 2, verse 16. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces with Reuben, 151,450, they shall be the second to break camp. After those camped in the east and the south headed out, the Levites carrying the tabernacle with, with all of its furnishings were next. Numbers 2, verse 17. And the tabernacle of meeting shall move out with the camp of the Levites in the middle of the camps as they camped. So they shall move out, everyone in his place, by their standards. The Levites and the tabernacle camped in the middle of the encampment. They also marched in the middle of the procession. Six tribes went in front of them, and six tribes went behind. Now on the west are the tribes descended from the sons of Rachel. Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin. Ephraim is the captain of this camp. Numbers 2, verse 24. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces with Ephraim, 180,100. They shall be the third to break camp. Finally, the remaining sons of Jacob, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali were camped on the north side. Dan is the oldest son of Rachel's handmaiden, Bela, and arguably the oldest of Rachel's household, is the captain of this camp. Numbers 2, verse 31. All who were numbered of the forces with Dan, 157,600, they shall break camp last with their standards.
The armies of Israel were almost ready to leave Mount Sinai. The focus of the camp was no longer at Mount Sinai. It was the tabernacle of God. God had moved his dwelling place to the movable tabernacle. The camps were established around the tabernacle while at Mount Sinai, and now as they were on their journey, the tabernacle would be in the midst of the armies. The leaders and divisions of the armies were now set over their troops, and they were on the move. God had prepared the children of Israel to take the promised land. I'm Dan Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.